Hi, I'm Lauren. I forgot to introduce myself last time, but hi. Uh, we're here for Young Makers as today's Agents of Change. I think this is going to be a really cool session. Lots of great uh, perspectives from our panelists. Uh, I'll start introducing our moderator, Kylie Pepler. Pepler. Uh, she's from Indiana University at Bloomington, and uh, she's an associate professor there. Um, she has her creativity labs, and she focuses on computational tools and materials and focuses on uh, youth, of course. Um, next to her, we have Darlene Cavalier, yes. Uh, she's with SciStarter, and she's the founder, and she also founded Science Cheerleader. We'll hear more about that, and co-founder of eCast. Uh, she's at Arizona State University. Uh, we have, uh, next to um, Darlene, we have Blaze Starkey, and he's with Defenders of the Water School, and I'll have you uh, listen to his pronunciation in Lakota. And uh, he, um, he has a fantastic um, uh, Cheyenne reservation uh, background. And then last we have, uh, but not least, of course, Quincy Brown. And she's program director of STEM for AAAS. And previously she was at nationofmakers.org. Uh, she worked with the Obama administration and also historically black colleges and universities. So here we go. Well, thank you, Lauren. Well, our, the topic of our panel today is to really think about and explore the ways in which learners identify meaningful social issues. So how do we identify these problems and then develop solutions to these practices? So I wanted to start um, just by asking our panelists, you know, why is this an important issue? Why are, we, why are we talking about this today? Okay, I'll go first, and I have to preface this by reminding everybody my specialty is in, in citizen science not really makers although I'm noticing there's a lot of um, crossover between that and largely in the adult volunteer world um, but even in that world we can start to see more of a bubbling up from the bottom up where right. what those volunteers are now becoming agents of change so they're starting to think about research questions that are important to them to address in their own communities and this is partly what I wanted to explore today great great what up, everybody? Um, yeah, so I guess I'm a Lakota. Um, I'm from Cheyenne River, but I live on Standing Rock. And the name of our school in Lakota is Mini uh, Wichoni Nakichiji Owaiowa. Um, the reason for me that I, I think it's important that we address these things is that I think that we need a lot of change. Um, the past 100 years for my tribe has been just pretty bad. I mean, about 100 years ago, my people, uh, women, children, men, everybody, and elders was pretty much getting hunted down by the United States government and killed just for existing. Um, and now, recently, uh, we just came and started the school in the camp that was uh, protesting against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And for a lot of people, it was sort of like a repeat of things that have happened in the past, um, but just happening today. So where we had the school, we've actually recently been pushed off of that by the police and the National Guard, and that's actually our land, so we got pushed off of our own land. So I just feel like there's a lot of change, and I feel like all communities and this community also needs to be involved in social justice and creating that change, and I believe that the students are the ones who um, who are there and already ready to do that and just try to facilitate that. So. Wow. Yeah, I always feel like I should go before a place. <laughs> 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 but, um, but I think for, for me it's about um, empowerment, right? And just having young people understand that they hold the key to the solutions of their own challenges. Um, and that I think often in communities, we're waiting for someone else to come in and fix something and change something. And that, that to me is very pow powerless, right? Um, and so for people to understand that you know, everything they need, they, they have, and the pieces that they may be missing, they can acquire, right? And it's not that hard to do, and they can be the agents of their own change. So uh, tell me, you know, kind of like what do you do and how do you go about sort of um, creating opportunities for youth to, you know, youth and learners to be empowered in your settings? Like what is your organization or what is your particular approach to that? Um, I run SciStarter. So this is a research platform of Arizona State University and North Carolina State University. This is a place where people who have citizen science projects, so this tends to be um, a research 
usually a formal research project, sometimes informal research project that can only be done with help from a lot of other people. So outside of the lab. Um, lots of examples, um, and I'm happy to give you some if you'd like, um, but there's more than 1,600 projects that are registered on SciStarter. So what we do is we help people find those opportunities. And sometimes they get involved because it's, um, it's a leisurely activity. They're already a birder, or they're an amateur astronomer and so forth, but many times they get involved because there's an environmental concern that they have, and citizen science allows them to be part of a solution. Um, or health issues. And so they're involved in projects like one called Eyes on ALZ, where people just are looking at five minute clips of videos and they're trained on how to look for blood flow stalls. And they identify those stalls and they're actually accelerating research on Alzheimer's research, research from Cornell. Um, so we're thinking about how we get the kids involved. Um, I think that for us, mostly it's been just like try not to get in the way or like try not to let other people get in the way. Um, of the kids at the school, one of them was six years old. Her name was Love. And she's one of the kids that ran. She ran all the way to the Army Corps of Engineers headquarters in, uh, that's down in the States. And then she ran all the way out to Washington, D.C. Um, and she's got like pretty short legs too, so like when she ran, you know, I mean, that was, that was, those legs were moving. Um, and really the whole movement was inspired by, by the youth and by people like finally sort of like listening to the youth. And we also um, have for a long time, way back the elders said that there's going to be a generation that seven, seven generations out, the people are going to come together and they're going to come together to create a change in the world. So. Really, it's like that generation rising up and making things happen. And uh, while Quincy talks to you, this is just, uh, I just want to hand this out. It's just like a little thing to provide context and distract you all from while we're talking, but it's just a little sign that the kids made too at the camp. Yeah, I feel like we should switch seats, Blaze, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's hard to top. Um, so I, I guess I like to think of the work that I do as creating the space to let other people just do what they do, right? And so I try to be attentive and listen to um, what some of the challenges are, what some of the constraints and barriers are, where students and faculty um, who I work with talk about why they can't do things, right? Or what, they, what it is it that's missing, what those gaps are. And then I just see myself as someone being able to go in and if it's money, to you know, find some money and then be able to pass that along to them. Um, if they need you know, materials, find a way to get the materials. So just whatever it is that they're needing, I feel like my job is to create the, create the space so they can come in and do whatever it is that they're, they're gonna do, not necessarily tell them what to do. I think people instinctively know what they need to do. Um, they just need support, right? So that's where I see myself. Excellent, excellent, yeah. I, I think that, that space making and, and you know, a lot of times we use this word of empowering youth, but it's really kind of just standing back and letting them sort of, you know, come into their own power and not getting in the way of that. I, I love that those ideas. Um, so tell us a little bit more about um, sort of a success story or, you know, is there a particular youth or is there, um, you know, one particular thing that you've done that you, you've found to be really powerful that, that um, you know, would help to populate the imaginations of the folks here? I'm gonna go first. We're gonna let Blaze go last. <laughs> um, so one of, one of the projects that I've worked on um, is was called the HBCU Making for Change Showcase. And so we've had students, we've done it for mm, two years now, I think, this will be the third year, uh, from HBCUs, kind of just think about a community-based problem, something in their community, and then design something that addresses that problem. And so we just really left it as open as that. Um, and they've come up with projects for, with, uh, to support uh, homeless people in their, in their communities. They've done um, solar energy. We've had trash. I didn't realize in some communities it's a very big problem, food deserts. Um, and so one of the projects that I can think of is a group at, um, in Prince George's County, Maryland, at Bowie State University. Um, they created the kiosks to support um, to address the homeless issue in the community where they were able to create this um, 
it had a, like a little screen on there where a person could just come up and touch a button and they would be connected to someone at a resource center who could point them and they could you know have an actual dialogue not through um, a com well through a computer but it's an actual human on the other end that they can see and interact with um, to talk about what what their issues are, what resources they need, and then have that person say, well, if you need shelter, here's where you can go. And there was kind of like a printer where they could then get a voucher for a metro card or a bus, uh, bus ticket. Um, or if they needed food, they could point that person to you know, a, a, a food kitchen. Um, and so that was something that the idea was just like it made sense, right? But when they were able to share that idea, they attended the um, the first National Maker Fair that we had a couple years ago. They attended the Capitol Hill Maker Fair and shared that idea with lots of people. And I think them realizing how much other people were excited about an idea that they had, that they were able to implement, to me was really what it was about, right? Um, to know that libraries, um, different community centers in Prince George's County were like, we need this. I think the students were kind of like, oh, we just thought we were making up, you know, some, it was just something that they decided they were just going to do. They didn't realize how powerful that, that really is. Um, and so I think that seeing that sense of empowerment in them and letting them understand how powerful their ideas really are and how much of an impact they can make, um, to me, is something I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, Darlene, what about what about your setting? What's a, a particular success story that you've experienced? There's a couple. And we don't, I don't actually, I'm not involved in the success. So I facilitate and connect and help put programs and platforms together that enable people to hopefully succeed. Um, but a couple of examples that come to mind, one is fun, but they all advance areas of research. And that was when um, uh, we had a project with NASA where they needed 4,000 microbes collected. So these are, the, the way you collect them is you swab with a sterilized Q-tip. And we uh, worked with the MBA to shoot the microbe collection kits out of the t-shirt bazooka yeah. into the audience. <laughs> And so we had people who were just there to watch a game and suddenly part of our research project. But they follow along. So these are kids and adult, adults. And 48 of them had you know, their microbe that they swabbed were flo was flown on the International Space Station, studied for its growth rate. And they're part of this, the entire spectrum of this research project, including at the end where they are asked to help analyze all the microbes that were sequenced and start to look for patterns. So we match that up with other forms of open data. Um, that, was, that was a fun one. Then there, on the other side, while it's not so fun, it's very important. Um, the long tail of citizen science is getting people to also be involved in um, conversations that have a direct impact on policy related to that. So um, a project that we um, help create with the Department of Energy is to have facilitated conversations um, and training for people to understand how to monitor their local environments because these communities were about to have spent nuclear energy waste deposited in their communities. So to help them feel a little safer about that and also be on the lookout for changes, um, this is also citizen science. And by the way, it does relate to making because um, some of the instruments that are used for citizen science are difficult to obtain or they're expensive. Um, so we have had youth involved in helping uh, JPL, NASA, NASA's um, office here, develop low-cost and open soil moisture sensors so that kids and adults can be involved in ground-truthing satellite data. So there's satellite that orbits over your head every three days. It's taking um, snapshots of the soil moisture levels. This is how they predict floods and droughts and so forth. That only works. That instrumentation is only calibrated because people are ground-truthing the data on the ground. So they needed more people involved. And what was eye-opening to me NASA does not care if you're a four-year-old doing this, if you're following the protocols. They don't know who's entering and giving them the data. And same with testing out their soil moisture sensors. So it's been pretty eye-opening. It definitely levels the playing field of who's involved in science and related um, civic engagement. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. the connections are quite clear. Yeah, yeah. it's exciting. So Blaze, how about in your setting? Um, I'm just curious, too, just sort of by a show of hands, like how if anybody, did anybody go to Standing Rock? Or did any, how many of you all like sort of followed it or have some sort of context for things? Okay, cool, right on. So for us, um, there was a lot of, I mean, the whole movement was basically a prayer-based movement. Um, 
but there was like a lot of really hard hard times in camp and there was sort of like a, a central drum and a lot of the prayer and stuff also there are also songs and there's like encouragement songs and honoring songs and that drum would pretty much always be there and when like another tribe was coming in or another group of people there would be uh, singers that would be singing like a, an honoring song or you know singing an encouragement song if there was a hard time going on and there was a lot of really hard times because uh, people were were you know going to try to go up to like sacred places or or to try to you know slow down construction or really just to exist and to be and to pray and they're meanwhile getting like shot by rubber bullets and getting maced um, I don't know I it's still a little bit hard for me to talk about because I, I saw a lot of stuff that wasn't good in the in the last few months but um, as one of the projects that we did for the school that we started um, in the camp, uh, which was just a community too, there was elders all the way down to little youth and little babies. There was a little baby born in camp actually, and there was weddings that were going on and all sorts of stuff. Um, but in that, uh, in that school, we had one project where we had uh, uh, kind of an elder come in and teach the kids how to make their own drumsticks, which are called ichabus. Um, so earlier in the day, the kids had made these ichabus, and they were, um, you know, going around like hitting whatever they could with them that looked like a drum, <laughs> and you know, like we didn't have a whole bunch of resources, and soon they found out that they could make a drumstick out of like almost anything. And one thing we had a lot of was broken tents because people would come out <laughs> thinking that their tent is going to hold up, and like if any of you have all been to the plains, like it gets windy, you know, like like real windy. So a lot of these tents, everybody thought, oh, I'm just gonna set up my little tent, you know? Well, they broke, lots of broken drumstick, lots of broken tents, so lots of ichabu made out of, uh, out of tent stakes and just whatever else they could find. Um, but there was one little guy, he was just about, you know, like this tall, I'd say. He was like, you know, six. And um, for also some context, like, Boarding schools went up until the 1970s. Um, they actually still continue, but have sort of supposedly changed, and most of them actually have changed to be a more positive experience. But like my grandparents' generation went to those. Uh, they're punished extremely for speaking our language. Uh, our religion was pretty much illegal until the 1970s. Um, so like, even though my generation, like even though I'm fairly young, like my generation still lives with a lot of that and like our school system that we have now like the on the reservation even it's still like a, a westernized school system it's still like not our school system it's not in our language it's not about our culture it's not through our culture so i think of the current school system as the modern boarding school experience and i think that that continues all the way through college because for me when i went to college i was one of like three native students at my college um and you know, like there just wasn't anything going on that was going on in my, my language or my culture. So it definitely wasn't supporting me to be fluent in that. So that's just, that's just background. But there's this little guy, right? We make drumsticks earlier in the day. And then there's like another tribe coming in and it's later in the evening and it had been like some hard, it had been some hard days because they were, the National Guard was coming in and, and they're like building up this force and people are, genuinely scared because in their family most people have stories of like their grandparents hiding from the cavalry or hiding from the United States military and like they're the ones that lived because they're the ones that hid so it's real you know what I mean when when you see that when you see armored vehicles and when you see police with sniper rifles you know it's real like you hope they're not going to shoot anybody but you don't know so people were understandably scared so this little dude, though, he's got his drumstick. And at that, at that drum, there's one chair. And there's like one open spot at the chair. And those guys start playing. It's kind of a group mix of elders and young men. And they start playing that drum, singing an encouragement song, singing a prayer song. And he gradually just starts making his way over towards that spot, you know, little by little. And then he gets in that seat and he, he sits in that seat. And, you know, he's there learning from those guys the way that you're supposed to learn in our culture, seeing that stuff. And for me, you know, like, 
even for my generation, that's not an opportunity that we got to have. So for me, for us, even just out of that drumstick, even just out of being in that context, for us to be, for him to be able to do that and have that experience, to me, that's like a, it's a little thing, but it's a very big thing. That means a lot to me. Wow, Blaze, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, because I think it, it's so important to, to really uh, speak to, to those experiences and sort of what that means and, and uh, for these youth. Um, you know, as you think further on, you know, what, what is it going to mean? You know, what do you imagine that that's going to mean for this, you know, for the little guy that you're just talking about? Um, what do you hope it's going to be like for him in about 10 years? And, you know, how, how is he going to grow from this experience? I have similar questions for both of the other panelists. Like, what is the impact of your work? What do you hope it will be in, a, in a, you know, another decade or so after this work is done? I pray that I'm here. Um, <laughs> and uh, to, see, to see 10 years from now. Um, but I just think, I just feel like what I'd like to see is people being able to make anything, right? I think the, tech, the cost of the technology is coming down. Um, it, it's becoming a little bit more accessible. I'd love to see accessibility in, um, in more communities. Right, um, and so that's one of the things that's kind of been in my mind, how we bring this. I think there's some places where people get it and they're familiar, and then there's still lots of places where they just, it's just unheard of, right? And so how we, how we um, rather than necessarily, you know, continuing to iterate and make it better and better, which we need to do, I think there needs to be, you know, a focus on kind of breadth and spreading it. Um, even in its current state, it's better than, than, than not having any. So just people being able to think, you know, I just need a little doohickey, right? And then just going across the street and making their doohickey. And then, you know, my, I mean, my daughter was selling candy at school, which is, I did not endorse that. But then to be like, you know, hey, you might need a doohickey too, right? And so like just this whole notion of being able to make whatever and to share it or to sell it. So this kind of small scale, very personal manufacturing to make it into a more form formal term is one of the things that I think I would love to see come to fruition in 10 years. Before Blaze. <laughs> um, what I think we'll see is what is happening right now. There's so much more and better access writ large. Access to the data, access to the instruments. Um, I mean, you can just look as far as Flint. It's, it's a great example of citizen science and yet it's a very typical example of citizen science right now because those people are still suffering. It has not been fixed yet. And that is not just citizen science, that's science. This is how, unfortunately, things work. But we're starting to see where people who are involved in that data collection, who ha whose eyes have been opened widely to not only the fact that there's a problem, but nobody's going to take care of it but them, um, are starting to push that envelope more and more and more where the, we do see pockets uh, and great examples of having an influence on policy and decision makers. But I would say the access to the data just didn't exist um, even a few short uh, years ago. So That's been huge. Right um, access to largely because I'm realizing of the, the maker community and this feeling of, you know, if you have a, a desire to act, there's more opportunities for you to be able to do that, build the tools access the low-cost instruments. Um, understand also how to interpret data that had been an issue. So all these barriers that existed for people to actually be involved in science are lowering quickly. And they're happening on a global scale, which has been interesting to watch, too. Wow. Uh, I, I think that I agree a lot with what both of you all are saying. and. Um, I would also just, I guess I'd like to see like our community also uh, be a part of, of that. Um, and I'd really like to see us be able to innovate and create off of our own traditional technologies to solve problems that we're facing and that I think really everybody is facing. Um, and you know, I'd like to see us actually able to benefit from those things too because so much of the food that you all eat, so much of the technology that we all use on a daily basis, we spent 10,000 years working on that, developing that, innovating that on this continent, and then we haven't seen the same like benefit from that. Even just like in recreational stuff, some people know this, some people don't. Kayak is a, it's a, Inupiat word, and it's like a traditional design that was innovated in Alaska. And I don't know very many Inupiat people who have been benefiting from, from kayak 
you know, the sale of kayaks, for instance. And then the other thing that I'd like to see is I just like to see the science community in general be a social justice minded community. Like I'd like to see scientists be like synonymous with somebody who cares about the world and cares about social justice. And like just generally for my community and why I'm here and why I'm working on this school is because I like to see my community be thriving the same way that it was a hundred years ago. And I like to see it, you know, continue to be in a position of strength of prosperity and you know strong inspired people moving forward into the future and I think that that's possible and I just like to see us all working together to make all those things possible and I think I think you're pointing to a lot of uh, commonalities across all of these stories you know does anybody see you know like as you're listening to each other and sort of hearing you know what are the things that you're hearing and sort of the commonalities that you're starting to see across these three initiatives so I, I think the sense that the moment when people realize that they have the power, right? So be it with data to say, you know what, I, I can access this data or I contribute to this, can contribute to a data set or that they can pass down traditions, that they can solve community-based problems. Um, I think that, that moment to me is pivotal, right, in the life of anyone just to know that you have the power to do whatever it is, right? Or in all these different ways to make these connections. Um, I think that's a, something that I hear common between the three, three of us. Yeah, thank you, Quincy. <laughs> and I think that just hearing everybody, like we all are here because we care about um, other people and other people's involvement. Um, and I think that's a good reason for us to all be brought together here. Yeah, I love too that it, you know we were hearing a lot about computer science today, a lot about making today. I think these stories kind of help to you know really illuminate the why, right? It's not just making for make's sake, or it's not just computer science for computer science sake, right? It's really about um, you know youth and this next generation um, empowering and being empowered and, and taking on these kind of roles in society, accomplishing these aims, you know, that we you know these hopes and that we, and dreams that we have for science, you know, for our communities, you know, for the work that's kind of being done. Um, you you know, how do we start to engage them in that discourse to actually enact change, you know, and, and really kind of envision a whole new future, right? Like, you know, schools don't have to keep operating the way they're operating, and our science doesn't have to keep operating the way it is. You know, how can we start to be more connected to each other and to the earth in a, in a, in a greater way? And I, I think that some of it is also, like, what challenges are we trying to solve, right? <laughs> There's, like, I mean, I love all of it, uh, but I don't need cars that drive themselves, right? I want people to be able to, to eat, <laughs> um, and, right, and have food, right, and have a good environment. And so I think it's great that we're, you know, that certain people are focused on getting cars to drive themselves and like doing all these other things. It's great, but like, there's some real things out there, right? Not that those aren't real, but um, you know, think if I had my way, I'd be solving other problems. And so I think getting more people even into that space to say what are the things we should be focusing on drives a conversation in a different direction. Right, right. That problem identification, it's like a, it's actually something we don't teach very well and yet it's so important. You know, this is increasingly a million different problems coming at us. Which ones should we focus in on and why, right? Like, and that's that's a real, I mean, that's that's really a key difference, I think, um, between, you know, being effective leaders and, and being ineffective in what we do. That's great. Um, Right. So my last question here for the panel is, you know, there have been larger critiques of the maker movement and about how, um, uh, you know, the maker movement or citizen science in your case, Darlene, um, you know, how can we start to engage diversity um, in that? And so it's been sort of heralded as, you know, kind of sort of a white male movement. And yet, you know, there's, there's hooks and things that, the, you know, each of you kind of identify with. Um, is there any sort of lessons learned or how do we preserve a space so that it's, it, you know, it really represents presents the kinds of things that you're talking about here? You know, any, any lessons learned or advice for this audience? I guess I'll, I'll go first on that one. Um, one, ha I think, has to do with the labeling of it as well. As I was talking to Suzanne before, where people who are doing these things, I know they don't know that they're a citizen scientist. And they don't necessarily distinguish, I'm a maker now, and now I'm a citizen scientist. 
Yeah. And they've been doing these things for a long time, long before we've kind of put this neat phrase upon them. Um, but more should be done to reach out to um, underrepresented communities, for sure. Um, and unfortunately, they often are, you know, the people who are suffering from some of these environmental conditions that are happening too. Um, that's a big, valid criticism of the field. More is being done, but it's not because it's not because of scientists, and it's not because of government. It's because of a need, and people are getting sick, um, and they are rising up and demanding change. Um, the other is uh, citizen science used to be very synonymous with retired people, well-educated retired people. The reason is they have the time, and time is a luxury to do any of this, making any, any, uh, any problem that we're talking about. Sometimes it's not addressed because they don't have time. Um, so I don't know how y y we create a world where more people have the luxury of time to address some of these issues. That's a, that's a big mystery to me. Um, and I don't think anybody has the answer right here. Um, other criticisms that we see in the field of citizen science would also be um, how can they possibly have data that's valid if they don't have science degrees? Uh, this mystery that anybody used to do science before it was formalized, seems like a new thing. And so that's been debunked many times. It's often in the design of the project. If the project is poorly designed, you're going to get bad data. Um, but by and large, the data is very, very good. Um, uh, I think changing uh, the way that we think about people who want to get involved in these projects as, as amateurs being a fine word, um, but not looking at people that they have. Uh, it's called a deficit model, as you know. Everybody in this room knows all this, but the deficit model where you have the answers and you're just going to allow volunteers to be part of a small part of your um, problem there. We still see that largely most citizen science projects are this deficit model where you're allowed to get involved in a little component even though you may have so much great local knowledge and context to add to it, not a lot of opportunity for you to do that um, frequently. And I can go on and on about the problems, but there's more good than bad. Right. And this is why I've committed my career to advancing citizen science. And I, I guess for me, just adding to that, like for my community specifically, uh, like two big things. One is like recognition. The fact that we already do have a, a huge knowledge system that includes a way of thinking about scientific knowledge and creativity, like that's already there. Um, and then the other huge one is like talking less about inclusion in a certain way and like more about resources and like if we had as much money, if we had as many maker spaces, if we had the same amount of support that all these other communities had, like we would have some pretty awesome things coming out of Indian country, but you can count the number of maker spaces and the number of just well-funded programs of any kind on Indian country on like, you know, one hand or maybe a hand and a foot. But for, so for me, it's a lot about, you know, recognition and then, you know, actually having the resources to make really cool ideas happen. I think, um, so kind of combining these, these two answers is about labels. Um, and also just re redefining what this maker community is, right? Because there's so many people who are doing this work and who have been doing it for generations and thousands of years um, who have not had the recognition. Um, but for some reason, the way we've kind of constructed and labeled this space, they just don't, they're just, it's not even that they're not part of it, they're just, they don't even factor into whether they're part of it or not, they just don't exist, right? And so redefining what this community is, thinking about um, where members of the community are, and it's not to me a matter of bringing them in as much as it is just expanding, expanding the space so that it, it encompasses them how they are and in who they are um, and where they are rather than saying, okay, well, we, you, know, you are part of us, come come over here. But for us to say, no, we need to grow and expand beyond you know, what, who we think of ourselves to be and so that you fit in, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm gonna open up the questions to uh, the audience. Um, uh, can I get a volunteer to kind of pass out a microphone here? Thank you, Lauren. All right. And if you could start um, just by offering your name and organization, you know, introduce yourself. Uh, go ahead and stand up as well. All right, I'm, I'm Ken Wright, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy. And um, one of the things I was 
I want to question the group about is, do you all have uh, enough resources out there to communicate the successes and the tools? Or are there uh, resources out there that would uh, help facilitate that? Because a lot of what I'm hearing is uh, there are things going on in various communities that are really promoting the activities, but others might not know about it and, and be able to catch on if they actually hear about it as well. So I'd just like to hear you all's opinion on ways to improve the communication associated with successes and tools and things like that as well. There's a lot happening in citizen science and, and communicating that. And uh, I'm part of a committee with the National Academies where they'll be looking at you know the benefits of citizen science and science learning. And I'm sure that will help. It's a matter of who's listening. Like, who do we want to hear? That's a little bit more difficult to get people that we want paying attention to the message that you're important, you're valued, and you're every bit entitled to be part of these conversations. That is, I don't see a lot of that happening. It tends to be university-based federal agencies sharing the message, so we kind of all talk to ourselves in that circle. Yeah, so like my, my dream is, is a little inspired by um, this whole hidden figures thing. Um, like I have no idea how to make this happen, but like I think it would be awesome if Beyonce just said something about science, <laughs> right? Like because there, so it's the who's listening part, right? Like we talk and we talk a lot and there's so many of us who are like we're wearing ourselves out talking, communicating, and then you can just literally walk across the street and there are people who've never heard anything that you've ever said, right? Or the, the importance of whatever it is your, your message is. And so I keep thinking, but like Beyonce's got like, I don't know, the whole world, right? Like following her. I don't know how you get her to say something about science. I haven't figured that part out. But I think some of it is, you know, the messengers and the fact that we, to some degree, are preaching to the choir a lot. You know, a little bit of change around the margins. Um, but, you know... So if not Beyonce, I don't know, Bruno Mars. I don't know. There, there are lots of people who I think if we could get some of these other folks involved. like, And I saw that with this whole Hidden Figures thing, to see these movie stars that people follow and watch or whatever, admire, talking about you know, NASA and space in a way that you know, kind of made that accessible to people who, despite all of the other you know, efforts, had never even heard of any of that. Somebody share a microphone with Blaze. <laughs> um, just sort of answering the part of your question about uh, resources to communicate successes. I think on, on our level, we need resources to access the resources that are already out there to communicate successes. We need like that base level resources to, to do that. And that's, that's certainly lacking right now. Yeah. I just want to add to that. I, I think it must be impossible if you don't know how to, we know how to write grants at ASU, and that's who keeps getting, not just, not just ASU, people know how to write the grants, and they have access to program officers. The rich continue to get richer in that regard, and that's, I mean, that's, a, that's the bottom line. That's why we're not reaching these small communities that have, not just, not just small communities, but you know, I could say this as somebody who was on the outside, and now I'm like embedded in it, both being a professor at ASU, being on all these committees and so forth, but that's only recently, that's only in the past seven years or so. Most of my life was spent on the outside of that, wondering, like, well, how do you put together a grant like that? And what is this Dunn's number yeah. that I need yeah. for this corporate thing? This, this yeah. institutional barrier is, is huge, and it prevents people from getting the resources. True, true. All right, we've got another question coming from our audience. <laughs> oh, um, well, we're going to need to get you a microphone. Hold on a second. point about um, what you said. It's so interesting you thought it was silly. Like, can Beyonce just talk about science? And I would even push that forward and say, does the CS education community take that kind of thing seriously? No. And I think that actually could be a great element for Nexus because, in fact, in the black community uh, and among the musicians and rappers, there is actually a huge awareness about the opportunities for coding. And I actually wonder if this is something that CS education practitioners have actually taken seriously and gone and met with these people. Now, you may all know about Prince. People here, have you heard about, I mean, you know Prince. Have you heard about what he's done in coding? Yes? Okay, great, you have. Now, what about the no, rapper? No, don't know that You don't know. Yes. Yes, he went and funded Yes We Code and did a whole concert about it. And then I also have to admit failure here. There is a rapper. Do you guys hear about the rapper? He invested $2 million. What's his name? 
Ch Chance? Chance, the, Chance the Rapper? Who's Chance yeah. the Rapper? Who knew about that? Yeah, no. I knew. Yeah, I mean, my cousins in Baltimore, like, all Instagrammed this to me. They were like, look at this. Or Will but, I Am. And yes, yeah. and Will yeah. I Am also is doing it. So actually, it's happening, but it's disconnected. You know, why aren't these people there? Here. I think, I think, yeah, so that's a, one good question. Maybe we'll make sure they're here next year. Um, there are, I mean, there are people in the CSED community who are tuned into that and are working to figure out how to um, disseminate the messages using those messengers, but it's still very disparate, right? So maybe there's a, there to me seems to be an opportunity for us to kind of come together with that focus in mind, right? But yeah, I mean, yeah, if Beyonce, I can't do any of her moves, so I'm not gonna pretend. But like, yeah, if she could get up there and do something and slip science in there or something, I just feel like that would be huge. Yeah, I don't know them either, so I don't know. I'm like, I can just ask my friends here. But yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Yeah, can, can you get Beyonce here for us next year? So, you sure. know, something. <laughs> yeah, so Sylvia, you've got a question. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is Quincy. I, I was thinking about what you said about... Oh, uh, Sylvia, why don't you introduce yourself first? Oh, I'm sorry. Sylvia Martinez, I uh, wrote a book, Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in the Classroom about um, connecting making to real educational pedagogy. Um, so uh, what you said was, I think, really crucial, to talking about empowerment as a, as a sp creating space and um, letting, kind of letting go. Um, and then I know that doesn't happen without planning, right? I think people have sort of a impression that you just step back and the magic happens, and yet it's incredibly thoughtfully planned. And yet I hear that for a lot of people, the solution to expanding making or expanding computer science is writing curriculum. And so I wonder if there's a tension between us saying, here's what you do, and but saying, but the real answer is to let people do it themselves. So that's my question for you and everyone else. Yeah, I think, the, I hate, tension just has a negative connotation, but I think there's a reality, right? I mean, the, the system and the infrastructure is what it currently is. It's changing. Jen Cuny's here. She's been doing amazing work. Um, I used to work for her, um, but she's been doing amazing work for over a decade in, you know, to, to change that. So it, it's, it's happening, but the reality is I've also worked in schools, right? And I have, it doesn't matter what I dream of in the shower, there's a reality when I walk in that door that is, that, that's, has to be faced, right? And so I think it's about creatively thinking about um, how to navigate, right? So I don't want to call it attention, but I think that having the infrastructure that supports that, which is what um, CS for All is kind of focused on, is is laying the foundation to create those spaces for everyone. So you know, you made me think about tension. Tension, like, is what keeps buildings standing up, right? Tension is not, in architecture, tension is not a negative thing. Tension is what helps things. But the way in which we talk about tension yeah, in this context I, is negative. I use it in negative. a negative way. <laughs> yeah, that's I, what, yeah. I'm reframing it in my own head, so thank yeah. you. I wanted to ask about, oh, my can, name is- Can you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay. I'm Sharon Thompson, and I'm the Director of Innovation at Bolus Charter School in Los Altos. California, and I wanted to really ask about how we can bring into elementary school classrooms, not necessarily the CS teacher, but how we can bring into elementary school classrooms teachers looking at their own community and helping students solve problems within their community and feel empowered even in the regular sixth grade classes or um, seventh, you know, not just in the CS classes, so that they really see how they can apply what they're learning and how they can use all of these tools to help their own community that they're learning in science and in CS and other classes. Yeah, great question. We, we, we can see that teachers are using um, citizen science projects uh, because they want to use real world data, so they either are analyzing real data or they're contributing to data. So they like that and uh, we do try to make it easy for them to find projects that are appropriate for their classroom based on age level, whether or not they have teaching materials. 
for the Broward County School District in Florida for their profi professional development each summer, they, they rate and review all the projects, well not all, 500 projects. And that became really helpful for that last question of kind of that social proof, peer-to-peer -peer social proof that I was unaware of. So we have participants that rate projects and then we have teachers that rate and review po projects because what they need tends to be a little different for the classroom. So I know that at least 500 of those have been rated and reviewed. And this is where we start to get insights into why they use citizen science in the classroom too. All right. All right. Well, I, you know, I, I have one last question for all of you, which is, you know, for, for the audience here, what can we do? What's one way that we could join you and help you, um, uh, you know, as, as we go home? You know, how can we catalyze our networks to sort of connect with your networks? An easy digital way would be um, we have an API. This is so boring, but it's pretty effective. There's an API for those 1,600 projects that it's free and you can embed it if you have a community or a website. Um, PBS does this and National Science Teachers Association and you can filter for the type of project that you want your community to learn about. That is so boring compared to what Blaze is going to say, but it's a very <laughs> easy thing to do. Well, and it, you know, can you write the URL or how can we get, get connected with your, your API? Yeah, we can write it on the whiteboard. Yeah. Excellent, yeah, just on the whiteboard over here at the end of our session, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, and I'm not like Beyonce's super big fan, but like that's now like I don't know a personal mission of mine. But I think I think you know if anyone wants to connect to talk about how we get you know some of these more different messengers, I'll just call it that way, in various genres and and areas to to kind of get on board. I think there are enough people who are kind of starting to do this and having these conversations, or I shouldn't say starting, but who have been doing this work. That it's just a matter of bringing them together and kind of aligning them. I think that would be that would be great. We should all tweet to Beyonce. For everyone in this room, tweet to her and say, science rocks. Please spread the word. <laughs> Brilliant. Maybe we could get Beyonce to stand with indigenous rights or something like that, too. You know, I think she'd probably be down, I hope. <laughs> um, uh, I guess, like, coming from this, like, where I'm coming from, which is all I can really do, like, um, <laughs> You know, right now we're in sort of a rough point where I feel like all of this really, really wrong, unjust stuff has happened. And like, even if you're watching only the major media, like, I hope that I hope that you've seen that. I mean, where I live, they call it like the deep north because it's like the deep south was, but it just hasn't changed yet. You know what I mean? And I hope that that yet is going to happen. But for me, it's like really hard to to see all of this and see it firsthand and then like see just, I don't know how like it can be life as normal in the rest of the country when when there's something like this, this bad or this major going down. Um, and so I guess my question is more like, and what I've been trying to think about is like, how can we as a people, as a group, as a movement, um, all of us like as humans, you know, how can we engage each other when it matters in the ways that, that you all are most powerful? Because like I think every one of you is in a position of power in some sort of way. And like while it might be good, like we should all definitely contact our representative. Some of our representatives are just jerks too and we can contact them a whole bunch of times and they're still gonna do the wrong thing, you know? So in addition to that, in addition to all those standard things that anybody can do, I mean, I'd love to just brainstorm with all of you about the thing that like only you can do, about the thing that is your unique like, you know, point of power, like point of inspiration and the way that like you can change the world, like you can um, like contribute to to something or contribute to something not happening that's wrong. And, and anybody who has ideas for me about that, I'd, lo I'd love to hear. Excellent, excellent. All right, no more questions? Any more questions? All right, one more question. Um, so it's less of a question and more of a comment piggybacking on what Blaze, Blaze said. Um, my name is Dorothy Jones Davis. I'm the executive director of Nation of Makers. And um, Blaze and I have had like a week long of conversations about like how we can do better. Um, and, and I think, you know, like to sort of sum up everything, I mean, the idea of 
of this panel is around change and being a change maker. And I think what he said is really a call to action. Um, it's really thinking about, you know, what small thing can you do in your community um, to, to really change it. And the idea of the maker mindset is really one of, of that whole empowerment that you all talked about and, you know, the idea that you can, you can change the world around you. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes we do search for sort of really large problems um, versus just looking in our backyard. Um, so I had you know, the opportunity to go to a number of different events this week. Um, some of them were looking towards other countries and other regions of our world that need help. But I also encourage folks to look in their backyard today, and that's something that I kind of have kept rep reminding myself um, as I look around, because I think it's really easy sometimes to look over and want to help you know, far, far away, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do that. But I think it's also you know, very good for us to look within our own communities and look for places that we can improve upon things, that we can change things, whether that be you look around and you don't see anyone who looks different than you. That's something you can change, right? If you, you know, see a problem in a community or you turn on the TV and you see that, you know, there's amazing oppression happening in a community that you can hop on, you're fortunate enough to be able to hop on a plane and go help, then you should probably do that. And, you know, I'm saying this as much to myself as I am to everybody else in the room, is when we're educating and when we're thinking about these things, how do we train our, our youth? How do we train the people around us, uh, us, including not youth, so adults? And how do we train ourselves to kind of think more critically about how we can be change makers more effectively? Um, how we can be empowered to kind of do these things? And so one example um, that comes to me that's not necessarily a maker solution per se, but a friend of mine, you know, she did something very simple when the whole Flint crisis happened. She was like, well, we need to have clean water. And so she organized water drives. And she ended up winning a bunch of awards about it. And she was like, in, as she was interviewed, was like, well, that's what she would do. Like, if someone needs water and I live in this community and I have access to clean water, why would I deprive somebody? Why wouldn't I just bring elderly folks? All she was doing is bringing cases of water to the elderly and to folks who she knew would, were already marginalized and would have a problem getting those resources. But that's a simple solution. Again, it's it's the things that are the, uh, duh, of course I would help out with this. And we have so many of them, like so many of them in our communities that really, I mean, the take home that I'm taking from this panel is that we all should get up and think about what one thing can we do in the next you know, week or month or year or even today that will change our community around us. So sorry to sound so Pollyannish. I'm about to go on to my panel, but I'm going to hopefully take that spirit with me. <laughs> <laughs> I like this change. I just wanted to add something really quickly. I think you're absolutely right. And actually, the comment you made earlier that you wish that the scientific community would become the social justice community. That is a very powerful message for young people today. They're very concerned about social justice. And I, it just dawned on me, I was like, we do this already, but I think we can be even more intentional about saying, it's not going to science for science sake. It's not to have a great career. It's not to make money. It's because this is how you're going to change the world. So when Beyonce says something, have her say that too. <laughs> you're our connection now. Hi, I just forgot to introduce myself. Christina Halper, and I'm the founder of All Star Code. We're a computer science education organization, but focused on young men of color. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Maybe just to follow up one little thing that me and Dorothy talked about, too. Like, you don't have to look that far for big problems. Um, they're, they're right here, and most of you all live near a reservation or near a large native community, too, even if you don't think you do. And um, yeah, the, the large problems are, are here, and like sometimes they're the large problems that we're actually personally implicated in and feeding into, and sometimes I think that's what makes it really powerful for us to address those problems as well. And you all should test your own water. <laughs> all right, on, I, I think on that note, um, yeah, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Please, round of applause for our panelists. Yeah, and wonderful, wonderful audience today. Thank you for each of you. I, I hope we are change makers as we leave this session. Yeah, absolutely. Inspired. Thank you, Kylie, Darlene, Blaze, Quincy. Thanks so much.